very exciting presentation today that I personally cannot wait for. I'm going to read a little bit of a bio first before turning it over. Dr. Yana Yunusova, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. I've been practicing all day. Thank you. <laughs> has earned her master's degree in speech language pathology from the University of Wisconsin Madison and gained clinical SLP experiences at both the University of Wisconsin Hospital and Clinics and the William S. Middleton Veterans Hospital in Madison, primarily in the area of neurogenic speech and swallowing disorders. She completed her PhD in speech science at the Department of Communicative Disorders at the University of Wisconsin Madison. She continued her research training as a research fellow in the speech production lab laboratory at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where she used a 3D electromagnetic articulography motion capture system and aerodynamic techniques to study speech production in patients with ALS. In 2019, she became a full-time professor at the University of Toronto, where her research is focused on understanding the effects of neurological disease in speech production. Her current research program is composed of three independent but related themes, the issues of early diagnosis and subtyping of the bull bar form of ALS, the study of neuroanatomical underpinnings of motor control and cognitive deterioration in ALS, and the development of new treatment methods, specifically a visual feedback paradigm for treating motor speech disorders. In addition to conducting research, Dr. Yunusova teaches in the area of motor speech disorders and augmentative augmentative, ugh, alternative communication. I was so close towards the end there. Without any further ado, though, I'd like to turn it over to our guest speaker, Dr. Yana Yunusova, and go ahead and feel free to unmute yourself right now. Hello, everybody. Thank you for such a warm and highly articulate introduction. Highly. I'm going to try to share my screen with everybody. So let's, fingers crossed. I think that should be okay. You can see it? Yes. Yes. Yep. If perfect. you could just put it in the uh, presentation of perfect, you're a step ahead perfect. of it. Perfect. Okay. And now I'm going to minimize everybody so that it does not cover all the video. So right now I don't see anybody. So if you have any questions, just speak up at any point in time. And again, Thank you for this, what sounds to me, a timely introduction. Everything as less is running uh, 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 another successful, I'm sure will be speech study. And maybe my presentation today will help and answer some of the questions that you might. Uh, it will focus on speech and orofacial biomarkers and tools in the assessment of ball bar dysfunction in ALS. I have decided to speak about speech assessment specifically because everything ALS is so well known um, to be at the absolute cutting edge of speech research. Okay, let me see how I can move between slides. So as I said, my overall goal today is to um, demystify speech assessment to you, explain to you what it is that we're trying to do and why we think it's going to be helpful. More specifically, I will quickly touch on ball bar dysfunction, certain elements of it. Uh, I'll talk to you about what biomarkers are and specifically digital biomarkers. Where uh, do speech assessments fit into the scale of different biomarkers? What are the ways to develop speech biomarkers? What are current advances? And what we're trying to achieve as next steps? So very briefly, bulbar ALS, as uh, uh, you all probably know, affects muscles of the head and neck. And these muscles are essential because they affect functions such as speech, swallowing, mastication, and to some extent, respiration. Approximately 30% of people, uh, three out of 10 people, um, presented the clinic with, with bulbar disease. And of the uh, patients who begin their disease in limbs, um, uh, approximately 80% of people develop bulbar signs. Of course, the fact that it results in loss of speech and swallowing is, is, is very debilitating. And many of our patients, is, and uh, um, most of the research suggests that loss of speech is very, very important uh, to patients. You know that in the clinic, uh, usually a speech language pathologist uh, manages uh, changes in speech and swallowing, recommends strategies uh, for um, uh, maintenance of speech and safe swallowing, and recommends assistive devices. 
switching towards a biomarker. A biomarker is an objective measure of a biological or pathological process. We want to have an outside measure that can tell us what's um, uh, biologically not right uh, with an individual, right? And you probably have all heard the calls by uh, a Food and Drug Administration in, in the US and Health Canada that biomarkers are urgently needed to improve outcomes of clinical trials. In that context, digital biomarkers is a relatively new sphere. Um, and what we mean by digital biomarkers are those that we can measure or extract by using software as a medical device. Um, they come through computer type measurements. They usually can come in large numbers and very rapidly. The important piece here that digital measurements become biomarkers only when they have a clinical physiological meaning. And my goal today will, will tell you a little bit about how speech is a very important digital biomarker. The other element of a good biomarker is something that matters to patients. And as I already mentioned, speech really matters to patients quite a lot. The uh, types of biomarkers that we usually look for are diagnostic. It's the ones that help with diagnosis. Prognostic and mo monitoring, the ones that can help with prognostication uh, of the disease. There are also risk, predictive, and pharmacodynamic biomarkers. Pharmacodynamic are highly important for clinical trials because those are the markers that respond to or show the effect of a drug. So why do we care? The bigger picture is clinical trials really need solid measurements, AKA biomarkers. Why? Because these measures are uh, supposed to help with early detection. And the earlier we can detect the disease, the higher chances is it is for the drug to work. Um, estimation of a rate of decline with certain measures is also highly important, particularly for patient stratification and subtyping. For example, identifying those individuals for whom the disease course are relatively slow or relatively fast because of the, the, there may be underlying differences in those presentations so that drugs, when they design, can be much more targeted. And of course, good, solid, very accurate measures are highly important because they meant to improve study design for clinical trials and reduce the number of patients in, clinic, in drug trials, make them much more efficient and cheaper and and, and, and um, allowing us to shorten the path between the study and the actual clinic. Good solid markers or measures are also important for clinical practice because they can improve time to referral to specialists. And from my perspective, referral to speech language pathologist, if we know that changes in ball bar state can be very subtle. Maybe a speech pathologist can come in and begin working with the patient much earlier than it is now. Also to improve management practices and advise patients on timing of the voice banking or timing of the assistive technology or um, a gastroenterology tube, uh, uh, tube feedings. They also give us an ability to prog prognosticate and anticipate the disease course, something that patients care quite a lot about. And of course, in, in broadly in the context of ALS, this is highly important because we remain to have diagnostic challenges, uh, experience, our patients experience diagnostic delay and uh, 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 occasionally misdiagnosis. The um, de heterogeneity of the disease is substantial and not fully um, understood at present, and we need to do better about that. Our interventions are largely, particularly in the realm of speech language pathology, focused on symptom management and are delayed. Um, the approved drugs are only modestly effective and present, and I'm sure you've heard many, many times um, clinicians saying many, many drugs fail. Uh, it's a very common theme in the LS research where experts bring this topic. What can we do better? How can we improve uh, clinical trials? And in that context, where speech assessment uh, became very prominent because 
we think that speech, audio, and or facial video assessments can solve, maybe can help solve some of these problems. Why do we think that? Well, first and foremost, speech has been seen and viewed clinically and in my line of research as a window into neurological disease or neurological health. Very often by listening to a patient, a clinician can identify not only that there's a problem, but also pinpoint what kind of problem it is. In addition to that, changes in speech are among the initial markers in a number of neurological diseases, not only in ALS, in some cases of Parkinson's disease, in some cases of multiple sclerosis and so forth. And in some cases, it actually allows detecting changes in prodromal uh, phases of the disease. It also has been incredibly uh, helpful in both disease tracking in the context of ALS, but also dysarthria or the speech disorder that, that um, ALS associated with um, uh, uh, progression tracking. We have also shown in some of our early studies that we can identify subgroups of patients using certain measures. And um, there were at least a couple of studies saying that speech markers may be very useful in uh, drug trials because they're much more accurate as measures compared to, to what clinicians typically do. And here's a quote from one of the uh, articles focused on myobarkers that says, even a short sample of speech may provide a sensitive snapshot of functioning uh, relevant of, of functioning relevant to many disease areas. So here um, uh, I can, uh, on behalf of everything else and everybody uh, else in, in our line of research, uh, big thanks for uh, taking the time and contributing to the speech recordings. Very briefly, what are the current problems? There is a clear research and clinic gap. I gave, gave you a slide of reasons why speech assessments are important, but did they tr trickle down to the clinic yet? Um, and the answer to it is really, um, is not really, not really, not yet. We're still working on it. Um, what are the problems with current assessments? They're done by clinicians and uh, very often subjective in nature, which basically means that they very highly dependent on the state of the clinician in a certain day. They're not standardized across clinics and clinicians, which means that between different clinics, one speech pathologist may mark something, let's say, as uh, moderate and another speech language pathologist may give it a score, a speech score of being more severe. And that's really makes it very different, to, difficult to compare. Um, of course, the more experienced the clinician is, the better they, uh, the better job they're doing in making these kinds of judgments. But we can't expect that everywhere the clinicians would be equally highly trained. Many measures that we use are not ALS specific, and they're also relatively poorly validated, particularly in the context of a, a particular disease, and as such, not very well ac accepted by a medical community. When speech pathologists initially, and researchers in speech pathology, uh, bring up the measures we usually use in our practice, um, uh, uh, specialists in drug trials uh, have been pretty skeptical uh, on accepting those kinds of uh, measures into clinical trials. We were clearly told that we need to do a better job. So novel clinical and digital tools and measures are much needed to detect speech and orofacial changes and track their progression to improve clinical research and clinical practice. And here, uh, you know, what we're trying to achieve is move from these kinds of clinical judgments when there's quite a bit of variability to much more standard, very accurate uh, measurements. I'm going to use the work that's happening in my lab to kind of introduce you to how research in speech in ALS is set up and where we are and what we're doing to improve this current state of bulbar assessment. I will focus on two specific larger topics. I will talk about 
um, the work we do to improve clinical tools, to make them more objective, more standardized, and more, con more concise. And I also will talk about the technology-based assessments. And I'll explain the differences as I, as I go along through the presentation. So clinical tools are the tools that um, your clinicians, in this case, speech language pathologists and potentially neurologists would use when you come uh, to visit uh, a clinic. And um, um, uh, currently, there are not that many tools that are available for them to use, or at least the ones that are very well designed and validated. When we approach a, a design of a tool, us researchers will have to uh, follow very, very strict guidelines on tool development. And uh, one of those guidelines is presented through uh, consensus-based standards for selection of health measurement instruments. It's a very uh, stringent set of criteria that's available. And our recent review in my lab uh, showed that there is currently a substantial gap in ALS research. On this table, you really don't need to understand much except look for a number three at the bottom of these tables and quickly see that only very, very few tools that are available for us actually have a rating of three. Things like ALS FRS have been uh, well studied and uh, uh, well validated, or video, video fluoroscopic swallow study is a very solid tool. Um, but the majority of other tools are really, really still require some more work. And as you can see, there's also a variety of tools. So uh, the clinicians have a, a, a significant repertoire to choose from and very often not enough time to make the right choices. So in my lab, one, this, uh, we took this as a significant issue that needs to be addressed. And uh, our goal um, is to design a clinician administer tool that, um, um, allows or highly validated tool that um, uh, basically creates a one-stop shop for uh, clinicians who are interested in ball, ball dysfunction, where all the items are carefully chosen, um, all of the items vetted through a panel of experts, uh, all of the items are explained very carefully, and then the tool is designed and um, um, uh, psychometrically validated. Currently, we have designed this tool, but of course, um, very early in the design, we were ready to launch a large study, 100 patients with ALS uh, tested on this tool longitudinally, uh, COVID stroke, and of course, it affected us uh, as just as um, everybody else quite significantly, and we had to um, move to redesign the tool uh, to be remote, which actually ended up being quite a blessing because now we have a tool that's set up for and tested in the context of tele telepractice. Uh, we have uh, proven that our um, items are valid. We also have have uh, run a reliability study demonstrating that they are reliable and currently undergoing a validity assessment. Uh, probably within about uh, a year, we will have uh, a fully designed ALS BDI available for clinicians to be administered in the context of a ALS clinic. The tool that's quick, we're aiming it to be under uh, uh, 20 minutes for sure. We're aiming closer to 15, comprehensive, fully validated, having a digital version as well as uh, you know, paper and pencil version, um, if necessary, suitable for telepractice. So that's our um, ambitious ask. These tools are contrasted with the other set of digital tools, which are used for continuous now home at home monitoring. And these are the tools that we are probing uh, as means to collect data to create biomarkers for bulbar disease. As James was saying, when I just started in ALS research, we would bring patients uh, like yourself into our highly technologically advanced labs, and we would measure both the acoustic 
acoustics of their speech, but also movements through technology that we um, uh, very high, uh, uh, highly precise technology where we put markers on people's tongues, lips, and jaw, and record them speaking to understand how did all these speech parts um, move together to produce intelligible speech, and then what happens when speech clarity and intelligibility gets lost over time. But of course, as you can imagine, these tools are very expensive, very difficult to set up and run, require substantial expertise, and cannot be used by clinicians in clinical uh, settings or in drug trials. Um, they were really for a very unique specialized studies. But of course, uh, this is not a surprise for anybody. Our world is undergoing a digital reporting revolution, a general digital revolution. And now there is more and more consumer grade technologies for audio and video or image assessment that are reaching quality of those lab, very expensive technologies that we used to use. You probably have heard of a a connect camera at some point, you know, people play games with it. It's still used for the assessment of full body movements. There is a 3D camera that you can see here um, uh, that is only focused on the face. But nowadays, we don't even have to have a 3D camera. Uh, there is facial cam uh, 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 tracking that can happen on a regular video, as you're seeing me on a screen right now. And of course, the audio quality recordings now on regular computers or iPhones is actually, is also exceptional as well. And as you can imagine, these technologies, very accessible technologies provide a lot of data and we cannot measure or um, analyze this data manually as we used to do. And so now there are AI algorithms that both identify, let's say, facial features, and I'll show you some videos on that, and also output measurements set automatically without us actually doing any work, which is quite impressive. Um, not that we're slacking, I'll, I'll tell you more what exactly than we're doing, but that's in the next couple of slides. Artificial intelligence, the bottom line is artificial intelligence is extremely helpful for us. And you have seen this in a lot of communications that even come through media. And of course, being part of everything in the list, you have seen announcements on how revolutionary the speech assessments are. And there are many companies now uh, examples being Redden uh, Lab in Australia, Winterlight here in Canada, Modality AI in the US uh, that are um, coming up with technological solutions. But of course, it's all wonderful. But as scientists, we say none of this is good unless uh, there is a strict process for the assessment of these tools and these measures, and we call it validation. The two particularly important part of the validation process that we conduct in the lab is what we call a V2, which is analytical validation, or comparing these novel tools with technologies that we call gold standards, those fancy laboratory technologies, and V3, uh, or clinical validation, basically showing that these tools measure what we expect them to measure in, uh, in a group of patients, showing that they have uh, an ability to classify patients, uh, possibly even with different diseases, as well as correlate with established clinical gold standards. In ALS, it would be ALS FRS. Let me very quickly give you an exam examples of how this works. So there is a, um, a couple of individuals uh, performing in one case saying a sentence by a Bobby a puppy and a sentence just in the second case right now, the gentleman is opening uh, his mouth. And this is how uh, an algorithm peak, picking up the landmarks of the face. We take these landmarks and we use them to measure how um, what's the range of the movement for different tasks is, or what the speed of the movement is, what the acceleration is, and other very important parameters that tell us a story of muscle function. And obviously, muscle function is what we care quite a bit in the context of ALS. 
But of course, these tools are not perfect. And a lot of work that we do in the lab, we try to improve on these tools. For example, here, you see a picture of a gentleman with a significant facial weakness, and you can see how an algorithm that has only been trained on healthy and very often young adults completely misrepresents the location of the mouth, right? It assumes that it would be here because that's what the machine was told the mouth is supposed to look like. And then we perform training of the machine to explain to the machine, in other words, what to expect in different kinds of um, faces, including faces with significant paralysis, including faces that are of older people, um, how to deal with uh, wrinkles or other asymmetricities. And this is one of my postdocs and they have done a lot of that work. What else do we do? We uh, collect data and share it in the form of a database with um, computer scientist out there who is interested to develop new models and retrain new models. And this is an exa another example of a work from one of my postdocs that actually um, trained a model, but also set up a set. And now we're sharing that set with uh, um, primarily computer scientists out there for uh, model development. What else do we do? After we develop the models, and um, this is a, an example of V3 or clinical validation, we demonstrate that the measures we obtain with these uh, simple technologies are actually meaningful. And this case shows a study that shows that a pattern of movement of patients with ALS is very different than the pattern of movement of patients recovering after a stroke. And so the, and the patterns that we expect in these two different diseases are what a clinician would expect. So uh, because very often when we engage machine learning and artificial intelligence, what we lose in the process is the measuring interpretability and we're, we actually check in it for it in our, in, our, in our work. This is another example of a V3 or clinical validation study which demonstrated that um, using audio recordings, or we call them speech acoustic recordings, may not be sufficient uh, for all types of analysis. And it's important to add video analysis here. And also uh, show that a combination of both video and audio analysis are highly correlated with the overall clinical score of a, both ALS, FRS, and in this case, also a speaking rate score. Very recently, we also started to transition from a 3D camera to tablets and 2D cameras on the computer. And this study demonstrate a painstaking work that uh, showed that uh, the video recordings obtained with a regular camera have uh, high consistency, they're reliable, they're able to longitudinally track changes. And that becomes extremely important when we promote these measures and these methods to, let's say, our colleagues in, in, uh, who's who are responsible who do work in drug trials and so forth. So um, what are the future research uh, directions that we're pursuing? And not just me, I think many people in my line of work, that's what we're doing. Um, many of us exploring uh, multimodal, both audio and video assessments. And um, I know that the, uh, everything LS has done multimodal assessments in the past and creating new algorithms for these types of assessments, which is absolutely important and, and wonderful. Um, we have established that these um, methods um, uh, have acceptable sensitivity and specificity. We're still refining the methods to be even more sensitive and specific, but that's ongoing work. They're highly promising. Um, in terms of limitations, a lot of publications out there focused on preliminary results in the realm of clinical validation mostly, and still show limited um, uh, V2 or analytical validation and psychometric evaluation. Um, we have not shown replication of uh, how the algorithms work on different 
samples of, of patients because very often most studies uh, show an algorithm that get trained on a sample and get tested on the same sample, which of course uh, creates a significant bias and significant um, error. We don't have data across various diseases and um, uh, um, that's, that's very important because we actually need to be able to train algorithms to distinguish uh, different types of speech presentations. It's particularly important for patients with more complicated, neurologically more complicated neurodegenerative presentations where multiple parts of the brain can be affected. And we don't have uh, an experienced need for quick and easy protocols applicable to clinical settings. I am particularly advocating for improving clinical practice with these tools. And most of my work that I've presented to you and showed to you really is to improve clinical practice um, um, and access by uh, uh, clinicians everywhere. So where are we going next? Um, completing analytical and clinical uh, validations and establishing psychometric properties, obviously, uh, because now multiple labs, multiple places are focused on it. It used to be, um, you know, even maybe uh, 10 years ago, there were just maybe two labs, three labs in the world that was doing this kind of work. But now they're the group of people, the group of um, uh, people who care and enthusiasts has grown quite substantially. So I think we are actually uh, very rapidly progressing in a sphere. We are still discussing uh, feature set development because it's very important to figure out what exactly we are measuring and, and, and how and how to match uh, very fine measures that we can get with these technologies, both audio and video, to what clinicians are expecting, because clinicians are largely the people who interpret the findings uh, uh, and the results of um, these measurements. So there needs to be kind of a communication and interpretation state, uh, stage between what the measures uh, show, because they're basically a bunch of numbers, and what the clinicians are expecting to see in patients' um, uh, performance. Um, we also are uh, working on the development of recording and analysis standards. Since there are many more of us now, we are in constant communication on how we can harmonize our protocols, harmonize the sets of measures. Because there's quite a bit of published uh, uh, these days, we can also put our knowledge into systematic reviews or basically package the knowledge that it can be much more shareable and comprehensive um, and um, um, understood between different groups. We are conducting uh, um, more clinical studies uh, with focus on applications uh, for classification, subtyping, and stratification, classification of different diseases and prognostications, and developing scalable solutions to make our tools much more um, accessible. And of course it takes a village. Uh, here is my team. Um, and of course, many, many collaborators across uh, primarily North America. Um, I work very closely with a team in, um, uh, in Boston, but also some other uh, labs um, in various places. And of course, a lot of funding. Most, consistency, uh, most consistently, our work has been funded by NIH, National Institutes of Health, because of their interest in drug uh, uh, developments and also improving practices in speech language pathology and other many other organizations. And um, thank you. Uh, hello from Toronto. And um, uh, I will take questions now. I hope I still have time. I couldn't see. Um, I couldn't see if I was running out of time. I was trying to be rather fast, so forgive me for that, but maybe this is an opportunity to clarify and talk about this some more. So oh, you've got plenty of time. Don't worry about that. That was a, a very uh, 
informative presentation. I want to thank you for that. And we got a lot of questions in the chat. And for those of you who may come up with some as we talk about them, feel free to write them there. Myself and our student ambassador, Lily, are going to alternate asking the questions. And I'm just going to kick it right off. Um, I know, and I know Lyle was answering some in the chat. Uh, so if you see repeats, apologies. But the first one was, could you maybe clarify a little bit, are cranial nerves bulbar? Yes, they are. Cranial nerves exit from the brainstem, and bulbar is basically, or bulb is another word for brainstem. Very excellent neuro question. That's that's wonderful. This is what we teach students, of course, in 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 our courses. So great question. Awesome. Thank you. So for our next question, um, so on the topic of CNs. Sorry, if you can hear the fire truck, but um, would CN5 and 7 be LMN? Um, and then would those affect facial movements? Say it again, CN being cranial nerve 5 and 7? Yes. Are those uh, lower motor neurons? Yes, cranial nerves are generally lower motor neurons. Uh, that's what they are. And cranial five primar primarily responsible for movements of the jaw and seven is responsible seven is actually called facial and so that's the facial um the the nerve that's responsible for muscles of the face that's a very easy explanation to understand that that matt was very clear thank you <laughs> great um so this one was i thought was interesting how is bulbar different from other speech impacting disorders and wouldn't those differences help with an ALS biomarker in themselves? That's a fantastic question. Almost, uh, almost, almost uh, uh, the kind of question that graduate students in speech language pathology asks, which is spot on. So basically, a lot of research in speech language pathology um, prior to, let's say, the last whatever 20 years have been perceptual. That is, clinicians went to, um, and usually in large clinics when there is many different patients coming and of a different kind, like in the Mayo Clinic, for example, uh, the clinicians would listen to speech of various patients and notice that the speech would sound differently depending if you have ALS or Parkinson's disease or multiple sclerosis or a stroke, for example, there would be markers of this difference in speech. And so now we're trying to match that perceptual differentiation with very specific objective measures. In ALS, for example, speaking rate becomes a very fundamental feature that we measure because it's an indicator of disease progression. As bulbar disease develops, speaking rate becomes slower and slower. And um, you may have noticed that, but it's not always the same. In Parkinson's disease, speaking rate is faster and faster as disease progresses. So it's a big contrast. So depending on the feature, it may be helpful. And depending on the disease presentation, it may be important to distinguish these kinds of differences because what they indicate to clinicians, to neurologists and speech pathologists that the different parts of the brain is a, are affected, right? There is a different part of the brain that's affected in ALS, which you all know upper and lower motor neurons primarily and some frontal cortex as well. But in Parkinson's disease, the effects are on the deep structures inside the brain, which is basal ganglia. And that's why the speech sounds completely differently. So it is definitely helpful for differential diagnosis. Gotcha. I hope, I, Thank you for that. I, hope I answered that question. <laughs> no, that was super interesting to hear. Um, and then the next question we have is, what's the biggest challenge in establishing a biomarker for a bulbar? The, the biggest challenge is to have enough sample that we have enough data to both train the algorithm and then to validate the algorithm. But I think you are 
actually as a group, as a community, are contributing significantly to solving this, this, this issue. So that, that is a really big deal. There have been a lot of studies until recently that would use a sample of, let's say, 30 to 50 patients and use a technique that basically pulls one person out of that sample and then uses the, the remaining, let's say, 49 people to identify if that that individual has a problem or not. And obviously it's, it's a, because the algorithm was trained on inclusion of that person, it creates certain biases and irregularities. So really to make this research ideal, we have to completely separate the, the samples on which algorithms are developed and trained and the samples on which they're tested, their performance are tested. So that's one big problem. Another big problem is clinical interpretability. Imagine there are some algorithms that generate a set of thousands of measures. There is one that generates a set of over 6,000 of acoustic measures. Imagine giving this to a clinician to say, oh, here it is, here is, here, here is data. It's highly uninterpretable. In the uninterpretable because when clinicians want to know why, right? And patients also want to know why. And when you look at certain specific measures, you don't understand what they mean. And we want measures that are clinically meaningful. Um, so that's another challenge just because the technology allows us to do so much. And sometimes we go ahead and do a lot. And then we kind of get lost in the amount of data that we generate. So. That's my, my uh, couple of cents on that. I'm actually glad you mentioned that because one of the challenges for ALS research in general is just having the amount of participants to you know, compare the data back and forth. And, and like you said, that's one of the, the wonderful things we have within this community. So thank you for touching upon that. Um, sticking on the topic of, of trials, are there any plans uh, right now for clinical trials specific to bulbar ALS that either you're involved in or could maybe recommend as well? Uh, right now, I kind of stepped down from very active research in the last year and stepped into an administrative role at the University of Toronto. Uh, graduate students, as you know, post-pandemic are experiencing a lot of challenges and I felt like I could contribute. So I was I was working on that for the last year. However, my term is almost over and so I'll be coming back full time to research and I'm sure I will participate um, in, in some of the clinical trials on the research side of things, but not right now. And Unfortunately, I don't quite know if there is anything specific going on for Balbar form of ALS. Gotcha. I mean, to add on a little bit more, even though you said you weren't doing the research, but do you know if there are any studies of promotor muscle beds and development of oral pharyngeal pressures? Hmm. I need a little bit more information on that because I don't think I know. Um, I know exactly. I, I'm not sure I know exactly what you mean. Well, whoever mm -hmm. asked that question, if you want to clarify it in the chat, we'll be happy to, to circle back to that for you. Um, but until then, uh, again, with more studies, when do these studies with cameras and with the studies with cameras and voice assessment, are they primarily looking at the corticobulbar symptoms? Yes. What we're interested really is um, the cranial nerves that somebody brought up uh, before, but also upper motor neuron features, right? Because what we're trying to do is, as we record speech, the Hypothesis is if the clinician can hear upper versus lower neuron features, we can train machines to do the same. And also we can train them to combine these types of features and um, predict the severity of disease over time. So I think that, um, uh, yes, the, the quick answer to that is yes, that's what we're focusing on. Okay, great. Um, and then 
Just in terms of diagnosis and symptom manifestation, does Bulbar um, affect those similarly or is it really case by case? That's a great question. Um, it's it, the, the presentation of Bulbar LS, just like the presentation of overall LS is, is pretty heterogeneous. Uh, one pretty consistent feature of Balbar ALS is, as I mentioned before, slowing of the speaking rate. Um, that that feature is 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 of diagnostic importance, and we track it using various tools, clinical tools. We track it using um, uh, these kinds of uh, digital tools, modern tools that we're developing. Um, but the rate and at what time in the disease uh, progression, ball, particularly for spinal patients, um, uh, ball bar uh, dysfunction um, uh, occurs is very difficult to predict at this point. I want to stay on this topic and I reorganize the questions a little bit to, to have a little bit of a lead through. So on that same vein there, is it more normal or less normal for those with bar bull bar to have garbled speech and lower body strength, but still have the ability to eat and drink normally? That's another very interesting question. It's not unusual. Uh, for some reason, it seems like speech is among the, the first and more affected ball bar um, dysfunctions present that is in many patients, speech seems to be more susceptible to the effect of the disease. We don't quite know why that is, but that seems to be uh, an observation. However, there's also uh, a number of people who experience uh, challenges in swallowing as not to um, underestimate uh, the effects of those, particularly because of the kind of consequences the swallowing changes. Uh, can have on the overall health of an individual. And here I mean, you know, leading to uh, malnutrition, aspiration, pneumonia, and other complications. Great, thank you so much. Um, and so for our next question, in terms of following facial movement in those different studies, how small of a difference can you tell? Oh, that's a great question. That's a very precise question. Um, it we can we can see millimeter differences. So generally, if you think about this, facial movements are small, right? Like when a jaw moves, some people uh, and it varies, right? Some people practically don't don't move sometimes their face or their jaw while, while they speak, and some other people move quite a bit. Um, but at any rate, it could be millimeter differences, very small. These, these technologies are very precise, and that's why we, we like them quite a lot. Actually incredible when you, given how quickly the technology has developed in such a short amount of time that it can be that precise. Mm -hmm. Makes it think what's going to happen in the future is very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a, a pals we have who has a specific question. They have Bulbar, have been to at least three different ALS clinics, and not one of them has asked them about their full medical history. W why wouldn't that be asked? Wouldn't the full medical history maybe help research? And and if not, maybe could you explain why that may be not be needed? And when you say it uh, going to the clinic, is it for a clinical visit or a research visit or by a neurologist or a speech pathologist? I think it may matter because if it's a if it's a visit, let's say to a speech pathologist, their scope of practice is is really focused on the presentation of the disease on what the status, functional status of an individual at that moment in time. Um, in my experience, and I've worked in a number of clinics, neurology clinics in the context of ALS, neurologists usually do take a, a very thorough medical history intake, but speech pathologists typically don't.
I do see a comment, neither neurologists nor speech pathologists have done it. Um, um, yeah, I can't, I can't really, I can't really comment on that. I'm not, I'm not sure why. Um, I understand it from a speech pathology point of view, but from a, 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 a physician's point of view, I wouldn't be able to answer. Because what you're saying is from the speech pathologist's point of view, you're just really looking at that in the moment, what is going on. So necessarily the medical history wouldn't really dictate that specific time frame. Absolutely. Because at this point, the job of the speech pathologist, and I mean at this point in the development of our field, the job of the speech pathologist is to recognize a functional problem and to come up with solution strategies potential interventions um, that would help at where the individual is functionally in terms of the, the quality or intelligibility of their speech, um, determine the need for uh, assistive devices or determine changes in diet, diet modifications or refer for a placement of a type tube. Gotcha. Well, thank you for your insight on that. Um, and then lastly, um, unless anybody else has any more questions, but how do PALS get more involved with your research? Please do send me um, an email. Um, I'm very easy to find if, if you just Google me. I don't think there is another Yana at the University of Toronto. So you can just simply put Yana at University of Toronto, or you'll find me. Send me an email. Or, or uh, it can be shared um, here, Yana uh, Yunusova at utoronto.ca. And unfortunately, I had to turn off all my social media accounts um, uh, because again of my administrative role, but soon enough it'll be back and I'll be reporting on our research successes through social media. And uh, of course, um, send me an email. I'll be absolutely happy to connect with you. If you have any other questions, um, uh, reach out and we always uh, engage participants. Now it doesn't matter what even country you're from because we are all online and uh, all our assessments, you know, we, we, we uh, curse COVID, but also to some extent are grateful to COVID because it really pushed us I've always said, oh, maybe, you know, 10 years from now, I'll, I'll do remote work. I'll, I'll develop telemedicine tools. But now let's just help the clinicians on the ground. But now it just forced us to do everything remote. And I think it actually is serving us rather well. I'm impressed. I've always been skeptical, but we're getting good quality data, a lot more data much more a variety of data. Um, so it's it's all really, I, th I think we are in the new and a very promising phase of where we are with this kind of research. Fantastic, I cannot thank you enough. That was a extremely informative and clear presentation.